webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website, autism.org. so much and welcome. Um, I'm so glad to be here today to speak um, with everyone about current thoughts and approaches to implementing dietary change for those um, considering a gluten and casein-free diet. Um, I really want to spend some time this morning uh, kind of shifting perspective on how we think about um, dietary change and what we've learned over the past few decades in this endeavor. Um, so I want to take some time and talk about autoimmune and neuroimmune diagnoses and the inflammatory concerns there. Um, that's relevant more than ever to uh, the uh, those with autism now and the autism community. Um, I want to spend some time talking about anti-inflammatory diets across immunological conditions. So what do we know that's happening in other um, and being researched in other diagnoses and how is that applicable um, to those with autism? Um, I want to look at assessment considerations and thinking about dietary recommendations. So for professionals, like how do you think through which um, how to apply which diet and when for a client and for families. I want to, I, I, through that same lens and looking at that same issue, how do we think about what's reasonable and appropriate to apply? And for me, that's really um, kind of looking at it from a more umbrella perspective. And that's why I really want to do some preliminary discussion on other immune concerns. Um, then I want to spend some time talking about practical application and fundamental approaches to transitioning and what that looks like. I've provided a lot of meat and detail in the slides um, for follow-up and for reference for everyone. I'm going to give a high-level um, talk. Um, I want to leave plenty of time for questions um, that we can address at the end of our uh, webinar. So let's get started. So what exactly is an autoimmune disease? Um, I've included a specific definition here that's been provided. It's, it's a standard one across the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Johns Hopkins. If you go to any of those websites, you'll find this information listed there. It's essentially when your body doesn't recognize its own cells and it begins attacking itself um, in various um, systems across the body. So there have been more than 80 autoimmune diseases that have been identified um, as of this year. Many more are being researched and we understand that things are emerging and we're learning more and more about these diagnoses. Uh, some of these diseases that you may be familiar with are listed um, in the bottom bullet, but they include things like diabetes, psoriasis, and autoimmune um, thyroid disease. So how is it treated? Um, our primary medical treatment on an ongoing basis, so this has been our goal from the very beginning, um, is to focus on decreasing inflammation and reducing this inappropriate um, immune response to the body's um, overreactivity. And to do that, we use several different types and classes of drugs, but we use um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And those are things that we all know as ibuprofen or Aleve. Um, steroids are another drug that's used to do this. And um, if a disease is non-responsive to that, we often bring in biological drugs that function to modulate um, the immune system. Um, and clearly each of those classes of drugs brings with it its own um, challenges and risks um, in that process. 
And so one specific type of this autoimmune concern is called a neuroimmune disease or disorder. And essentially it, it is what it sounds like. And that is it's an immune response in the central nervous system um, that is an overreaction. So this autoimmune response to foreign invaders, and that can be a virus or a bacteria or an environmental toxin. Um, and again, I've listed some of those examples below that are standardized. Typically, each of these diseases presents in adulthood, so there aren't a lot of good sort of apples to apples comparisons um, in a pediatric population, but this kind of gives you an idea about looking at um, immune issues that also affect the neurological um, and system and the nervous system. So why is this important in the autism community? Uh, I wanted to kind of walk through that and open with this because we know in the autism community that we've been looking at neuroimmune concerns for many, many years. There are researchers across the world that have been evaluating um, immune dysfunction in autism for years and years and years. Uh, Judy Vandewater's group at UC Davis has looked at maternal immune response. Um, there are many different types of um, immunological and neurological uh, issues under current investigation and also that there's a track record in the autism community. Um, and it's important to me just to point out, like we are, this is, so this is not new to us in terms of research. Um, we are looking at, if you look at the bottom uh, of the screen, we're looking at the whole um, microbiome, GI tract, brain axis, and that um, is reflective of the neuroimmune involvement that I mentioned. There are papers out on um, treatment. You'll notice that one uh, regarding cannabinoids. Um, and then there's bench science out there as well that looks at um, proteomics. Um, this is a paper that our group participated in publishing last year and um, just identifying potential markers of neuroinflammation in those with an autism diagnosis. So um, in looking at this research that's been published over the past 15 years, I'd say, um, both from a research perspective and also a clinical perspective, we know these things. Um, often people that we see have a dysregulated blood brain barrier, which means that um, things can pass across that barrier that are not intended to in a healthy setting. Um, we have reduced natural killer cell activity, which means um, we have an inability in some in, in many instances to fight off um, illness or infection. We have pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, that work is um, kind of uh, has been around for many years. And other areas that we have um, looked at, and there's a body of work out there on, are, are looking at mast cells, TNF alpha. Um, and IL-6, which have been researched in specific uh, areas of brain, brain inflammation. So why did I put all that out there? Um, for me, it was kind of a, an opportunity to draw some, I wanted to connect the dots in many ways on, okay, we've established that autism is a type of um, inflammatory process. Clearly there can be neurological and neuroimmunological involvement. Um, and so why is all that other autoimmune stuff I just spoke briefly about important? Um, well, we know that researchers across the world, again, are looking at the use of anti-inflammatory diets or um, traditional diets or healthy diets and diets as a prescriptive response to many other types of um, autoimmune diseases. And that's important, I think, because in the autism community, um, we've been in a place where uh, the research has not effectively borne out the um, benefits that we see in um, clinical application of dietary intervention. 
Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. It, it can boil down to study design. There are concerns with um, appropriate application and knowledge of diets. There are concerns in some studies with, um, I guess, length and duration uh, of the study uh, treatment phase. And in addition to that, I think the overarching issue really is um, dietary studies are, are not really um, profit driven. So they're an expensive and time consuming intervention to study when there really is no um, benefit financially for, um, it's not as easy as researching um, a medical intervention, for example, and therefore they're less likely to um, be perceived as appropriate sources of um, study at this time. So I, 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 I wanted to put all of that out there um, because we've been doing this for a while and we have clearly seen benefit from removal of what we now know and classify as inflammatory foods. So when we talk about gluten and casein-free diets, what we're doing is removing two proteins that have been studied um, to be inflammatory across multiple disease processes, across multiple um, concerns. And I think that's important because having done this for a very long time um, in the community, families often meet resistance um, in approaching their primary care practitioners or other practitioners about making any dietary change for their children. Um, and, it, and I really wanna reframe both the language that we use and also um, perspective on how to create a healthy dietary approach that is inherently free of those proteins um, and also free of other things as well, um, but it reframes it for um, professionals that families are dealing with. Because if we, if we choose to say we are implementing an anti-inflammatory diet or something to address inflammation and um, these concerns, it's often better received than saying, Oh, I'm, I'm, I would like to try a GFCF diet. And that's largely because of the historical information we have about a G, what a gluten and casein free diet is um, and the negative research literature that's out there on that intervention right now. So having said all that, um, this is not an unfamiliar topic for us in the autism community. We have been looking at anti-inflammatory approaches um, to nutrition and diet for a very long time. We just haven't been framing it with that language. So I want to kind of provide some um, perspective on that. And so an anti-inflammatory approach is what we've said for a very long time. Diet is not a one-size-fits-all approach for the children that we see. It is not diet in a box or a column, for example, on a slide or a spreadsheet. Um, it is individualized to a specific person's needs. It's a template, so it's a roadmap and an area of guidance that allows us to move toward comprehensive healing. Um, it includes uh, a lifestyle change in many instances, and that takes time. Um, it provides proper nutrition across macronutrients and micronutrients and nutrients like phytonutrients and phenols that we don't even have full information on yet in the research literature. And most importantly that uh, we see clinically is that following an anti-inflammatory diet that excludes gluten and casein in doing so, um, provides an opportunity to stabilize blood sugar, which is crucial for pediatric patients. I mean, we see this need to um, stop the after school simple carbohydrate, processed carbohydrate um, crash that um, time and time again, we work with, with our clients. So a healthy diet 
does include fats, healthy fats, um, which we've talked about in the past. I think that um, there are many resources available on the Autism um, Research Institute website for implementing healthy diets that can provide really specific details on adding each of these things into a dietary rotation. Um, it removes pro-inflammatory foods. So anything that's refined and processed, um, additives, preservatives, uh, processed carbohydrates primarily are, are the ones that you want to think about there, but that can include cereals and cookies and frozen meals and um, chips. Um, ideally, we remove pro-inflammatory foods such as um, anything that's been grain-fed um, from a, a protein perspective. So eggs should be ideally um, grass-fed and free range. Um, we avoid sugars, we avoid all those inflammatory fats that I've listed on this slide. Um, no sodas uh, and anything at all that is added to preserve or color or flavor that is not considered a food, that is actually considered a preservative or um, a coloring or a natural or artificial flavor. Um, lots of families we speak with um, want to continue um, or don't understand or have really intelligent questions about why we diminish sugar intake. And um, that has evolved over the years. I mean, we've known for decades the damage that sugar can do um, it increases inflammation across the board, and that's the number one reason that I um, believe that children who are in crisis and uh, facing acute both health concerns, sleep concerns, um, school concerns, behavioral concerns, that's one of the things that we say, let's just get rid of this um, and see what happens, because we're removing an inflammatory trigger from intake completely and evaluating results of that. Um, so we don't say that across the board for everyone at every time. And certainly if you have a child who has been um, in care and following a healthy diet, um, yes, it's okay to have a little processed sugar every once in a while. Like we're not absolutes in this by any means, but this does mean think about when you're preparing a meal plan or thinking about food for the day, it, it means that you have to logically think through, okay, we're not going to do muffins in the morning and um, cookies as a snack and then um, something sweet for dessert and a bedtime snack. It just, we, uh, it doesn't work and it continues to feed um, the problem rather than contribute to the solution. <clears throat> it also speaks to that um, blood sugar concern that I mentioned earlier, and it allows for regulation of things like anxiety and aggression, and also a regulated wake-sleep cycle, which is important for the children that we see. So, I just want to provide, and again, I mentioned that I have um, plenty of detail in each of these slides for you, um, but I wanted to provide kind of an overview um, of diets that families um, and practitioners around the country and the world uh, use regularly and apply and then tweak. Um, and all of them have this approach of diminishing and rem removing um, those pro-inflammatory items that I mentioned. They there are differences in their makeup and their, um, um, I guess, ratios, you could say, inclusion and exclusion criteria, applications, so phases versus um, you are or you aren't, black and white. Um, but I really wanted you to see that the foundation of a healthy diet is very similar across all of these. And the majority of them, with a few exceptions that I'll point out, um, are gluten and casein-free. 
So a Mediterranean diet in general um, is focused on fruits, vegetables, um, plant-based protein, um, and grains if they're tolerated. Um, it has been researched substantially. It is a recommendation from numerous national and international healthcare organizations um, for promoting um, health and longevity. Um, it is uh, easy to adapt to um, for families. And it's just, it's the way that we suggest and have suggested for almost two decades that families eat, and that is real food. So nothing that's processed, um, but just food. Um, and it, it focuses on um, plant-based proteins and fruits and vegetables for a fiber perspective and also protein with minimal healthy protein included. So that includes um, healthy fish um, and other lean protein. Um, I will say that it often includes uh, primarily you, you prepare items with healthy oils. There are occasionally recipes and recommendations for use of um, cow's milk-based products, but those are easy to substitute for or um, evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis about and, and remove entirely if necessary. You'll also see, and we've done this for several decades as well, the use of diets called the specific carbohydrate diet or the GAPS protocol diet. And this is one step beyond. Um, traditionally, it was one step beyond, in terms of clinical application, a, a strict gluten casein and soy-based approach. Um, this was often applied for children who had severe GI concerns and disorders, and those that um, it was hypothesized had some sort of bacterial or fungal overgrowth that needed to be addressed um, through kind of um, this strict approach toward removal and reintroduction of different foods. Um, and often it's been used in our community to treat those with a, a yeast overgrowth and with positive response in many instances. Uh, I would say that it's been used in other diagnoses as well because it focuses on um, healing the gut and the microbiome itself. Um, and it's very similar as well. It was originally written and did include, if you'll note on the slide at the very bottom here, that it included cow's milk products um, it has been applied in inflammatory bowel disease models. It's been researched across the board. And in those, they've tried both dairy-free and also um, SCD diets with um, dairy included um, with good results. In our application, we have always uh, approached it, um, removing dairy entirely. Uh, and it naturally, based on its prescriptive use, and it was originally developed for treating celiac disease, so it naturally does not include gluten. Um, these are all uh, foods that have been um, included in this approach. And if you'll note, they're very similar to those that we just spoke about um, in the Mediterranean diet. Um, natural foods, lean meats, um, fruits, um, and vegetables. Another approach that's out there right now um, is a paleo or primal approach. And again, you will see this emphasis on simply real food. And I like this pyramid because it does help us think through, um, and it it is put out by those who um, promote a primal diet, um, but it really focuses on the very same components that we've just talked about in the prior diets. And that is think about fruits and vegetables um, and build from there. Options for um, one of the um, protocols that I wanna talk a little bit about, which is called the autoimmune protocol. Um, it's based in that primal or paleo uh, 
diet that I just mentioned, but it goes one step further and does some additional removals um, to allow you to reintroduce foods and test them. Um, the same nutrient rich um, appropriate foods are recommended and um, it, is, it, it is a timely approach. So when I mentioned earlier that some diets phase in very slowly and then reintroduce slowly, I would say that that is uh, appropriate and um, applicable to both the autoimmune paleo protocol and also the specific carbohydrate diet because both of those require um, kind of a, an introduction phase and then a full diet phase where you gradually reintroduce appropriate foods, assess for tolerance, and then you challenge. Um, in terms of an autoimmune protocol and that phase that I mentioned, um, it eliminates everything there that you see on the left of on the left side of this chart. So you get rid of all of those things that we've mentioned a few times now across dietary approaches. Um, and then you eliminate the things on the right side of that and challenge them as you begin to reintroduce new foods. Um, again, these, this is a staged approach to reintroduction with our families. When we use something like this, it's often um, navigated with introducing um, items that you see in that number one column first. Um, and from a often from a pediatric preference perspective, so we begin very slowly and choose foods that are welcomed by children. Um, this is complex and can be, I think it's very meaningful and I, I think it, we can see profound change with it. I also believe that um, we need to be thinking through um, options for uh, realistic diets moving forward from something like this um, and, and maybe reframing lifestyle for the entire family and everyone in the household in some respects, if you see a profound response like this. That's not to say that there's healing and there are exceptions and there are also opportunities for challenges for sure. Um, but you, if this is an approach, it, it, this one takes, um, is often applied for those who have very severe GI symptoms or very severe systemic inflammatory symptoms. So I wanted to give you kind of an idea um, of what an anti-inflammatory diet would look like for just one day. And there are always exceptions, but this is actually pulled from a diet record um, of a child. And I know that many of you are saying, right, but that looks great, but I have a child or I work with a child who will not touch half of these things. And I understand that, um, and I know we go slowly. Our experience has been if we go slowly and are patient, our children can surprise, surprise us. We, are, um, we have been very successful at introducing new foods with specific approaches, and I encourage you to go back and look at um, any of the webinars you can find on the Autism um, Research Institute website about approaches for um, introducing new foods, how do you deal with children who are uncomfortable with new food, um, and what does that process look like? Um, because uh, ideally we want to move all of us to a diet that looks similar to this, not simply the children that we were, are trying to help and serve. So, uh, just to run through basics on, um, and I won't spend much time talking about each of these, but in general, across the board for any of those dietary approaches, the options that I'm gonna present for you here for reference are um, uh, appropriate for any of those um, protocols that you research and wanna learn more about, um, and uh, there are a few, uh, with a few exceptions that I'll, again, I'll point out, but I suggest, um, and one of the things that we talk about a lot with families who have kids who are highly responsive to food, 
or have an elevated um, histamine level or have a family history of significant food allergy or a history themselves or a food allergy is rotation through proteins. So things that you can make look very similar if you have a child who um, is a picky eater, as we've labeled them. I We like to call them selective eaters because we're all allowed our opinions about what we want to eat. Um, so anything that you can choose that will be similar will be more likely to be accepted at first, but we, we recommend a rotation through proteins on a regular basis. In terms of specific preparation concerns for those following a diet to decrease inflammation. You really want to look at um, stewing meats, poaching them, or braising them. Other, um, other grilling specifically, but other cooking methods can add um, uh, this glycation end product, which is an issue. And you can certainly read more about that, but I wanted to bring that to your attention. Like uh, um, for most of us, um, preparation style does not matter, but if we're looking at inflammatory processes and reducing inflammation, other preparation methods are better. I've included this here just because I think it's important. Families often ask this and that is, yes, but beans and um, other legumes are really problematic for my child. I, um, how, why would we wanna put this um, in my child's diet? And the answer really is if a child comes in and they are in such an inflammatory state or their GI tract is so compromised that they're having difficulty digesting beans and legumes. Absolutely, you do not want to reintroduce them or push that as a food until that digestive absorption inflammatory process is resolved. But we should not be afraid of them as we heal and as our children heal because a lot of the research points to the benefits of beans and legumes in a diet. Um, there is a number, uh, uh, there are a number of research studies out there. Um, there are a number of protocols that incorporate these successfully once you've dealt with acute inflammatory processes. Um, and I've just put some pointers here on what and why really, um, but uh, I hope that it's something that you explore. If you're dealing with an acute situation, I would suggest that you put it lower on the priority list. In terms of fats, I would say that um, there are many healthy fats that are available um, in most communities now. Um, we want to use anything um, that is highly nutrient dense. Some families incorporate things like butter or ghee. I will say that there are many casein free certified commercial ghee products available now that we are comfortable having trialed those with multiple families that um, it's tolerated by those who are on a gluten and casein-free diet specifically. Um, I, I, I talk to every family and we counsel every family about this on a one-to-one -one basis because there are some concerns with um, negative response to that, but we have seen few, if any, responses to ghee introduction over the past decade. I also want to just mention here the nutritional benefit of bone broth. This is another component of an anti-inflammatory diet that we like to bring in. Um, we introduce our kids early to bone broth support um, as, a, as a healing element of any diet. Um, provides a number of different nutrients. It also provides amino acids and um, is supportive of the mucosal lining of the GI tract. It um, supports and heals and addresses any microbiome concerns that are there. Um, and the research on this is, again, somewhat behind uh, where we see what we see clinically, primarily because it's a food not a medical intervention, and we're just not looking at it um, in terms of um, uh, 
research and intervention perspective. There's more research out there and available now if you start to look for it, uh, primarily because it's become a commercial commodity. And with that, um, there are multiple really, really solid providers out there where you can provide, you can purchase commercially prepared bone broths, but you also need to be an informed consumer, consumer and know what you're looking for um, because some brands are much better than others. The last thing I would really talk about um, in terms of nutrient values and diets would be water. So just making sure that one component of what you're doing um, is a, a plan for getting ample water in uh, every day, uh, which supports all the other body systems that we're trying to um, uh, assess and address with um, dietary intervention. So as we start to um, decrease inflammation, we need to be providing hydration for the body to be able to do its job well. In general, I've noted it there in the last bullet point, but in our clinic, we recommend one ounce per pound of body weight until a child is about 100 pounds. And we suggest 100 to 120 ounces daily beyond that. Um, I just wanted to touch on briefly polyphenols and phytonutrients because these are specific synergistic. These are foods that have synergistic components that work together with the vitamins that we have teased out to date. And we're not quite sure why um, together they're better. The whole is better than the sum of you know, its parts as it were, and they are um, found in a number of foods that aren't typically in a child's diet. So not a lot of us eat beets and cabbage here in Texas on a regular basis, but you can rotate those things into your diet with good results. <clears throat> One that we are familiar with are various berries. Um, there are, um, if your child, I will say, children who are hyper responsive and in a place where they're reacting to everything that they put in their mouth at that point, tend to be highly responsive to deeply colored foods. So again, like um, the legumes that I mentioned earlier, you want to be thinking this through and rotating these in um, as soon as that healing has taken place, it's not necessarily something that you want to introduce when a child is suffering with GI concerns or heightened inflammatory response, but um, they certainly contribute to healing once it's underway. I guess lastly, um, I just wanna take a few more minutes to kind of um, summarize and say that uh, we know and we've known in the community that we walk in and work in and are privileged to be a part of um, for decades that what we eat matters. We've known that um, in our homes or in our, our clinics, um, what we offer a child to eat um, has a profound effect often on how they behave, how they sleep, um, how they think. And the research is catching up to that finally. We have to look a little bit further afield. And that's why I wanted to kind of open with my thoughts on research and other um, inflammatory processes. We have to, um, we're, it's catching up, but what we're doing, I think, is definitely on the right track. And I wanna encourage anyone out there who's thinking about starting a diet or who has been hesitant to try something, whether you're a practitioner or a parent, um, I encourage you to not be swayed by the idea that that GFCF diet thing doesn't really work um, because it does. And we've learned more than we knew 25 years ago. And we know a little bit more about how it works we still can't define it from a laboratory testing perspective necessarily for every child. For some, we can. Um, if they have an underlying or comorbid condition like celiac disease, for example, or uh, an overt casein allergy, we can. Um, but 
I, I hope that what you see here is there are so, the, the world is so wide now in terms of opportunity for appropriate application of what we've known about removing gluten and casein um, that you find it as hopeful and encouraging and try to um, uh, do the intervention that you've been thinking about. So I'll close now for questions and um, I look forward to that conversation. Well, thank you, Kelly. That was a great presentation. Of course. There are lots of questions, as you can imagine. So I'll just dig in and uh, you can answer as many as you can get to in the time that we have. Perfect. So the first question that we have here is that you mentioned um, pediatric patron, sorry, pediatric patients with autism sometimes present severe food selectivity and nutritional supplements can be helpful, but they are often used to rapidly correct that malnutrition. But some of the supplements are so high, unusually high in sugar and they have milk. So what are your thoughts about those who are malnourished or, or who are highly selective um, approaches? Um, is that the best thing to do in an emergency or are there other approaches nutritionists talk about? So I think that's a great question. I, um, it's hard to navigate. We think about it both short, like the short-term solution and the longer-term solution. So um, the bridge to get us where we want to be with a child who is highly selective um, are um, various nutritional supplements. Um, we typically, within our clinic, do not recommend anything that um, is a gummy or a sugar-based liquid. So we rely on products that are either a powder that can mix in a liquid that contains no sugar or um, chewable. There are some chewables that are non-sugar-based um, or capsules. And often if, if the child is older, four and up, really will teach them how to swallow a pill so they can take those vitamins to make that gap. And then we talk about bridge foods when we start introducing, like how do we introduce nutrient dense foods that make up and take up some of that as we expand the diet um, so that we don't need the level of support that we need in the short term. Okay, great. We've gotten lots of questions about food lists. So looking for GFCF food lists or lunchbox lists or things that people can use. Do you have any recommendations about that? Or, or do you find that there are just a lot of resources on the web? I think that um, there are several presentations on the Autism Research Institute site that talk about basics on that, that have food lists. So I would recommend if you wanna know more about that to go there. Um, there are other options on the web. If you uh, just Google gluten and casein-free food list, you will find many. The problem with that is what we've really talked about here and that many of those things that are included are really not the profile that we've talked about here. Um, so what you wanna be seeking out are foods that meet the criteria in the lists earlier in the presentation. Got it. Okay, so what about nut milks? So if you're substituting in nut milks, you talked a little bit about this, but are there, if you're looking at the labels on the milks, when you're picking, what would you pick? Or is it, is it good to make your own milk? What are some strategies from a nutritional perspective for that? It is often good to make your own to start because then you know just how clean the product is. It's fairly easy to make your own nut milk now, um, given the resources that are available just at the local grocers now. Um, having said that, there are a few products out there on the market that meet criteria of some of the diets that we I mentioned, but not all of them. Um, what you want to steer clear of are any, any sweetened. So you want to choose an unsweetened version of a nut-based milk. And then you want to look for additives and preservatives. Some of them have... Um, products that are okay and tolerable for kids like carrageenan, not um, necessarily uh, what we would like to be including, but it's in many on the shelf milks and seems to be well tolerated for the majority of our kids. Um, but unfortunately, I can't just say here's the brand and here's the product that you want because it's a little bit more complex than that for um, individuals. 
So you talked a little bit about how this can be a whole family affair. And I, there are a few questions about that. Okay. Is, it, is it forever? I think you've answered that question before. And then, you know, it, how do you get the entire family motivated to get involved in this? Like, what is the, have you seen families do that successfully? And what was their, their take on it? Absolutely. Um, and I think that um, the way to sell it to the family is that families take care of each other, right? That's been our most effective strategy and educational tool for families that have children who are younger and two or older and teens. Um, and that changing an approach like that does help everyone. Um, we have seen it across the board with families and hesitant spouses and everybody benefits when you start thinking about what you're eating. Um, we've had families, you know, who stop blood pressure medicine because they've changed their diet in a healthy way to a more Mediterranean diet based approach. We've had um, so many good, we've had younger siblings eczema resolve. We've had all of those things um, when you start thinking about dampening down inflammation can benefit from a diet that we add for the particular acute presentation of one member of the family. Having said all that, if you have teens, for example, or um, if you have a child who um, is, uh, is help, primarily healthy and doesn't have any overt, a sibling that does, those are times when you can say, when it's in our house, we want to keep, these are the rules we want to follow for our home. When you're with your friends on a Friday night, yes, it's okay if you do X, Y, and Z, whatever X, Y, and Z is. Yes, you may have a slice of pizza. Yes, it's okay if you want a soda. Um, and those are absolutely the things that we would want to say for the child we're implementing the diet for once we're beyond that acute phase. So more often than not, the families that we work with intervene for the household and the family as a unit, not for the individual, because ultimately everyone benefits and no one feels excluded or left out. Okay. And so the second part of that question that came up was the cost. So there's a perception that this is going to be very expensive, like this nutritional change across the family. Do you have any insight about that or what family do. does that share? I do. Um, we, that is a common concern. We all worry about that. Um, and probably, it's probably been a decade now, but we actually did um, a, and I think that it might, it's dated, but it is still on our website. Um, we did a study looking at, um, can we uh, feed, uh, can we eat on uh, what's provided by SNAP benefits for a week's time. Could we do that? And we did that quantitative evaluation and we can because we don't need fancy food and we're not talking about shopping at the most expensive grocers in town or mail ordering everything to start. It can be done simply and well. And we encourage families to think back on their grandparents. Like this is how our grandparents ate. Like it is real food. It is not convenience food. And we've all been in that place of being harried and hurried and having to get things done so quickly that it's easier just to buy the thing that's made or partially made or, um, and that, um, removing those things from our approach and buying the, you know, free range eggs, which are a little bit more expensive, but worth it for the nutritional value and the lack of, you know, hit that we get essentially with things that are typically processed um, is worth it in the long run, I think. So it should not increase the budget line substantially if you do it um, the right way. This is a big shift, but this person's asking about fish. So wild caught fish are usually considered having high nutritional value, but our son's doctor suggests consuming farm raised fish instead of wild caught because the oceans are so polluted these days. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or have you heard any discussion of that? I think it is a mixed bag at this point. I understand the pros and cons of both. Um, my worry about farm-raised fish is that there are some um, 
providers that do it really well. And there are others who we don't know the contamination from a number of sources in that environment. Um, and unless they're actually, if they're farm raised, the other component that's important to think about is not only do we wanna make sure that they're affirming there are no exposures and no concerns with that, but that they're adding nutrient value through whatever they're giving them for food because farm raised fish, fish have much less likelihood of exposure to and absorption of the appropriate um, food sources to um, increase their own nutrient density. So I, I, I think that it's a case by case basis ultimately, and you have to make a decision as an informed consumer. Like it's very different to purchase from um, a small manufacturer that you know and trust who's tested. And there are those who um, catch wild caught fish and test frequently and know what their um, burden is. Um, and you can expect and ask for the same issue with farm raised fish. Um, but the jury's out because we just don't know, you can't compare apples to apples across the board. You know, it's too muddied. All right. This question is about anti-inflammatory vegan food. So I know you touched on some of this, but do you have any favorite recommendations for your patients who are vegan? So I would say that uh, a really good place to start is, and there, and, um, a lot of, the research in this area looks at soy, which is a mixed bag for those of us in the community that we walk in and live in. Um, so I would say starting with that autoimmune paleo protocol, the AIP um, protocol, if, if you do the homework on that, it will send you to a few different links that have very good resources for meal preparation that meets the criteria of anti-inflammatory and also um, vegan. Um, and I can't, without looking it up here, I can't send you those links. I can probably put my hands on them pretty quickly afterwards and send them to you, Denise, if someone needs them. Sure. Um, but I, they have those lists that everyone wants. There are several of those out there specifically to answer this question. Okay. This question is about the microbiota. I don't want to put you on the spot. I know there's been varied research and you talked a little bit about how research funding is, is complicated for the nutritional community. But do you have any thoughts about how the GFCF diet may affect that just based on your readings and, and research that you've done yourself? So... Our experience and our knowledge across uh, both the research and also clinical aspects of what we do, um, it, I think it depends on application of that diet because you're talking about two different things. I mean, children may respond well to a diet and microbiota change if we remove the types of foods that are um, being eaten on a gluten-filled diet. So instead of um, transferring, you know, a donut, a gluten-filled donut to a gluten-free donut, we remove that challenge. You know, it, 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 are they responding to, and is there an issue with any sort of um, bacterial dysregulation or fungal dysregulation in the microbiome? Is that what part of the problem is? Is it all of it? Um, we just don't know. Um, my gut is that it is, you know, the perfect storm. So you have these huge protein molecules that are suddenly allowed to cross into um, the bloodstream and then transferred to the brain and in, um, uh, affect the central nervous system and the brain and responses. Um, and once you start to kind of dampen all of it down across the board, it resolves. Um, I, don't, I don't think that answers the question well, but I think none of us really know why still all these years later. Okay. This question is about eggs. So if you find that somebody has sensitivity to typical chicken eggs, um, is it worth it to go experiment with other types of eggs, quail eggs, different things, or can you assume those proteins are universal? No, nope, you can't assume that they're going to respond to one, um, to an egg from a different species, like they respond to a chicken egg. Um, often we move kids from chicken eggs to duck eggs with good results. 
uh, duckings are now more and more available in markets. So it seems to be the easiest transition. It also prepares similarly in size and structure and taste. Um, so I would say that if that uh, is a strong histamine allergy to a chicken egg, I would confirm that they don't have, you know, I, I would say you want to make sure that you're not overloading duck eggs or any other type of egg until you're sure there's not going to be a response that leads to some sort of histamine rash or worse. Hey, you're going to like this next question. What is the recommended amount of water each day that people should be eating, which is also part of our nutritional approach? So ours is uh, one ounce per pound of body weight until the threshold of about 100 pounds. Um, many families continue going. So kids who are 120 pounds get 120 ounces. Um, our teenagers that we work with, like those graduated water bottles where you mark it off on the side and they just carry that water bottle around with them all day. Um, but that's, that's our goal. We've looked at it and talked with several other practitioners about that. Uh, and we're all in agreement that that seems to keep everyone hydrated. The other thing that um, that level seems to manage is constipation because we know that constipation can be driven by dehydration. And if it's a chronic setup, um, that level of water intake seems to address it well. Right, and something, you know, a lot of people sort of avoid drinking water. And I don't know if you see that more in this population, but it can be kind of a trick to get it in sometimes. So if, if that's the case, we had some parents ask about that. Are there things that you recommend putting in the water that don't you know, counteract what you're trying to achieve? Um, often we'll, um, in terms of any flavoring or sweeteners, no, not necessarily. If we have kids who are open to other things, we often use a squirt of citrus. So whether it's a squirt of orange or a, a little bit of lemon or a lime, we'll do that. Um, another thing that we use is a powdered, um, vitamin product that we often flavor water with a couple of times a day. Um, there, it comes in several different flavors and it's um, sweetened with uh, sugar alcohols. So it's not, it's not affecting blood sugar and working on that pathway. Um, and that seems to be a nice substitute for kids who want something like either a, a juice box or a soda. Um, those seem to kind of translate well over time, but we just try to get kids to enjoy water as water. 